Merlin, a name that even today conjures from the darkness of the subconscious an image of the ideal sorcerer, whose worldwide notoriety is only matched by the most ancient and well-known of Greek and Roman gods and heroes. Merlin, the guide of Arthur, Merlin the sorcerer, Merlin the madman, Merlin the prophet, Merlin who walks with stags, pigs and wolves, Merlin the druid. But what are the myths of Merlin based on? Who is this figure and what did he represent? It is undoubted that there was a real man named Merlin, or more correctly Merlin, who lived in post-Roman Britain and it is with the early accounts that we are concerned with here. Early Welsh poetry contains many references to this figure and his story. He is known as Merthyn Wyst, meaning the wild. He was a soldier in the army of Gwendolé ap Pradio, who was a ruler of Avderith near Carlisle, Lugvalium, the stronghold or strength of Lug. He was one of the last great pagan kings of Britain. The image presented of him in poetry is of a shining warrior king wearing a golden torque. Merdin served this king as a bard, or possibly as a druid. When Gwendolé lost a major battle and the army was slain, Merdin survived but lost his mind as he escaped into the Caledonian forest. The name Caledon itself seems to relate to the Brythonic word for concealing or hiding. In the forest, living as a madman, Myrthen gains the gift of prophecy, and it is this ability he is most strongly connected to in early Welsh sources. Poetry has him communing with spirits of the forest, hiding in trees, and living in communion with animals. He goes from an aristocratic position in the court of a king to a figure wearing rags and searching desperately for food, lamenting the coming of winter and its barrenness. He appears in conversation with Taliesin and with his sister Gwenthith, always making prophecies, often of what will become of Britain, warning of invasion by foreigners and even the end of the world. Later stories by Geoffrey of Monmouth also follow this concept of Merthyn, one tale has him riding atop the back of a stag wearing an antlered headdress. These accounts could not merely be the invention of Geoffrey, as they are too close to the archaeological evidence that show widespread use of horn figures and stag antlers in types of ceremonial context. For all his invention and his merging of various figures, Geoffrey is drawing on a real historical inspiration, real historical knowledge. We might think of depictions of Cernunnos, like that featured on a cup from Gaul where Mercury and Cernunnos are together, surrounded by various animals. Mercury, Cernunnos, seated on a rock beneath a tree, holding out a torque next to a hound and a stag. Both figures are connected, but one is a lord, the other a shaman. Merthyn is drawing on the history of the Druids, and his character and role in relation to Arthur is that of a druid. Taliesin makes this remark in the chair of Taliesin. Who will join together the common people, worth the nobility of liquor, and a load that the moon separates, the placid gentleness of Merthyn, and philosophers of intelligence will study about the moon and the influence of an order of men exposed to the breeze of the sky. In Geoffrey's prophecy ascribed to Merlin, there is much that deals with the stars and constellations, which will be looked at in a future video, but it is certain that from poems of Taliesin and Geoffrey that they believed the Druids and Merlin to engage in celestial observations. Indeed, the prophesied birth of Arthur is based on just such a celestial event, the appearance of a comet. Merthyn is likely first connected to Arthur by Geoffrey of Monmouth, but the idea of a figure such as Merthyn being connected to a sacred king is as old as human society, and certainly played a large role in pre-Christian Celtic practice. Merthyn is depicted as facilitating or orchestrating the birth of Arthur, and later leading him to power. 
In this role, he is representing the Druid's connection to the future king. For other Welsh examples, we need look no further than Gwydion and Lle to see a direct parallel to the story arc that's eventually ascribed to Merlin and Arthur. Many examples from Irish myth give support to this. The king was a figure divinely connected to the gods and a representative of the king of the gods on earth. As such, he had to embody the gods, imitate the god, perhaps even be an avatar or son of the god. The druid would be able to determine this divine connection. Merlin's first appearance in the Arthur myth is in the Historia Regum Britanniae, written in 1136 by Geoffrey of Monmouth, but he is drawing on many earlier sources, such as the 9th century Historia Britonum by Nennius. It is this 9th century work that gives us the key to understanding the basis of later Merlin. Geoffrey not only takes the figure of Merlin Wist, the bard or druid turned madman of Caledonia as his basis, but takes from elements of another figure that features in the tale by Nennius, one also repeated in a slightly modified version in Irish and again mirrored in an unrelated tale called Seith and Seelis or Sevelis. In Nennius's tale, King Vortigern is seeking to build a castle upon a hill. But every night, the walls are shaken to the ground. He asks his wise men why this is, and they tell him he must sacrifice a boy with no father and sprinkle his blood on the ground at the foundations of the structure, or it will never be built. This bloody story has basis in historical fact. Bodies have been found at the base of some Romano-British fortifications presumably as an act of spiritual strengthening to the structure. This was not a Roman practice, in fact, it was illegal under Roman law, but was a representation of strong local belief and religious continuity in Romano-British society, and it's preserved accurately in this medieval tale. He sends men out to scout the land to find this boy. In other versions, the mother claims that a young man came to her in the night and impregnated her, and this young man was a spirit or demon, and most likely in the original versions, a god. And similar stories regarding the myths of the origin of heroes and great kings are told throughout the world, but such examples include Cuchulain and Conor Amor, and set up the image of this figure as a divine king, the son of a god. When found, the boy is brought before Vortigern. He is informed of what is to become of him, and the boy reprimands the wise men as being fools, for he reveals that at the site there is a pool of water, and in that pool of water there is a vase, or in some versions a chest, and within it is a tent or cloth, and within it are wrapped two serpents, or in the Irish version worms, one red and one white. Periodically they engage in combat, and this is what causes the failure of the castle to be built. The boy informs the king that it is not permitted for him to build a castle there, but that he, the boy, has been allocated that mansion himself by fate, and that he will remain there. And he identifies himself as Ambrose Gulidig, meaning the immortal war leader, and says he is the son of a Roman consul, likely a contrived origin, it's not even consistent with the story itself. Uh, but it's an attempt to conflate a mythical figure with a semi-historical figure. Now, this Ambrose, or Aurelius Ambrosius, goes on to become uh, the great king that overthrows Vortigern and establishes peace and order. The symbolism of these fighting serpents is given as the pool being a representation of the world, the tent as the kingdom, the red serpent as the British, the white as the invading Saxons. This seems to be a motif of the most ancient sort, but which is given a particular explanation, not likely the same as the original, for we find a slightly different version of the same thing in the tale of Seith and Suelis. Seith is generally recognized as cognate with Nuada Argetlov, a ruler of the gods in both 
British and Irish myth. He's faced with three plagues on his rule and can only be saved by his brother, uh, Saelis, or Sevelis, who is ruler of Gaul. Now, Saelis is most likely an expression of Se, and ultimately Lul. One of the problems afflicting the kingdom is a loud scream on May Day, which causes infertility, terror, and death. Saelis says the cause of this are two fighting serpents, which must be caught, sealed in a chest, and buried together. The origin for this is obviously identical to that associated with Ambrose and relates to a figure that grants or secures sovereignty. And in my opinion, this tale originates or is related to the Caduceus of Mercury with its two serpents that face each other but are locked together. And it's this idea of fusing two separate elements together to neutralize their negativity, to create a symbiosis, to create a harmony out of two opposite forces. This, I think, is the original symbolism of this myth, but it gets uh, ascribed to later historical events. And here I'd like to remind people to uh, come support me on Patreon or support me through the website, because this takes a great deal of effort, a, a lot, a lot of time. And so your support is not only much appreciated, but actually needed. And it will help us work towards our future goals of creating a sanctuary, physical locations, sacred sites, etc. Secure, helping to preserve our history, our sacred sites, and really developing our understanding of our pre-Christian traditions. So Ambrose, or Aurelius Ambrosius, as he is sometimes identified as, a name meaning the immortal golden one. It's also important to stress that he was presented not as an old sage, but as a young boy, who is supposed to be without a father. This is in keeping with the image of Se in the Mabinogi, a young man whose father is unknown, but who is tutored by Gwydion, identified as a powerful sorcerer, a trickster, uh, but ultimately benevolent figure who features large in poetry by Taliesin, almost always in connection with Se. The gravesite of Gwydion is said to be somewhere in the Nantse area, the geography plays an important part in this mystery, for the boy's prophecy and the recovery of the two dragons was made at Dinis Emrys, the site of the fortress Vortigern attempts to build. This site is only 10 miles from Nantse. This entire region appears to have been highly sacred to the god, for not far from Nantse is Dinse, the fortress of Se a massive Iron Age hill fort overlooking the Irish Sea. Part of the fort has now collapsed into the sea, but the site is being excavated presently, and the roundhouse inside is said to be one of the largest found to date. It is also suggested in the stanza of the graves that Mabon, son of Modron, was well acquainted with Nantse, further increasing the likelihood that Se and Mabon, son of Modron, were originally different names for the same god. With this in mind, it's very likely that Dinis Emrys was originally associated with Se. He is linked to the origin of the site in Seath and Seelis, and it's very likely that the youth brought to the presence of Vortigern was a representation of Se. By extension, though he may well have been a real person at some point, the character of Emrys or Ambros or Ambrosius, is likely drawing on mythical elements of the story of the god liberating the people from oppression, but who also has strong prophetic and magical powers. He is, in later accounts, made brother to Uther, and in some versions, he is the origin of the name Pendragon, or it is at his death a comet crosses the sky that takes the appearance of a dragon and this is where the name Pendragon originates. In the version told by William of Malmesbury, Arthur is in fact but a war leader for Ambrose. Ambrose also confronts and defeats Hengist, a euphemized horse twin god of the Saxons, and this seems to further increase the likelihood that not only Hengist is a euphemized god, but Ambrose himself is also a euphemized god. Lastly, and perhaps most 
damning of all is the stanza of the grave of Merdin, which reads, Bathe an apsian imnuis venith, siagor seu emris, priv thewin Merdin emris, which roughly translates the grave of the nun's son on Nuis Mountain. Lord of Battle, Seu Emris, Chief Wizard, Merthen Emris. The meaning of this is clear, though some have tried for obscure translations rather than read what is in front of them. The Lord of Battle is Seu, and this name means lion, but it's used interchangeably with the name of Se. And the fact that lions are connected with kingship probably increases the likelihood that Se is, in fact, related to kingship. So, the name is used interchangeably with, with Se in medieval Welsh. In fact, it not only interchangeably, but is, I think, in from my experience, is the more commonly used one. And his chief magician is identified as Merthyn. The mountain is perhaps Ben Nevis the highest mountain in Britain, identified as the place of Seu, Emrys, that Merthyn is given the same last name. However, more likely in my opinion is that the name is not being used as a Gens, it's not being used as a family identifier, it's being used as an adjective. All these people were entirely fluent in Latin, in fact Joffrey wrote in Latin, and so the name is being used as it directly translates. The name is being used as immortal, as meaning the immortal Seu, the immortal Merthyn. This is the way it's being used, in the exact same way as Latins used the word Invictus after many different names of gods. Some people incorrectly think that only Sol was named Invictus. In fact, all, all of the major gods uh, were at various points referred to as Invictus. I think that this is a very similar thing going on here. Now, we know, of course, that Mercury in Gaul was very strongly associated with mountains, and something that I should have mentioned when discussing the location of Dinis Emrys is the idea that there is a hill with water at the top of it, because this also, from evidence in Gaul especially, is associated with sacred sites associated with Mercury. That there is a hill or a mountain with water either near it or, or most especially at the top of it, that is like the most sacred place. And so this further uh, highlights the likelihood that this site is, is linked to say. But Likewise, the highest mountain in the land, of course, would be essentially the kind of Mount Olympus. And so this is likely that sort of connection being made. Now, the nun's son refers to Ambrose, who is in some versions said to be the son of a nun who is violated by a demon during the night. Now, this is reflective of the story of Se. It's reflective of the story of Ambrose, but it's also reflective of the story of Merthyn, because all of these are somehow partaking in the same myth. Therefore, it becomes a sort of jumbled confusion, in part or mostly due to the conflation that Joffrey has engaged in. However, the relationship between these figures is clear. They're not the same figure. Um, the relationship is equivalent to that of Gwydion and Se, the sorcerer who raises up the warrior king of an unknown father. And the reason Joffrey uh, wanted, to part wanted to take over that aspect of the story of Ambrose is because it relates to prophecy, and he wanted to secure Merlin's role as this prophetic druidic leader. So Merlin, as the druid, conveys the kingship on behalf of the god. He makes prophecies inspired by the god and serves the king. There is confusion because there is a blending of the mortal and the divine in these stories, and Aurelius Ambrosius becomes more strictly a warrior figure, while Ambrose, as in Merlin, becomes the personification of the druid, based largely on Merthyn Wist, 
likely one of the last actual druids in Britain who served the pagan king, Gwenthele. The final thing to mention is about the role that Joffrey ascribes to Merlin in orchestrating the birth of Arthur. We should recall how Gwydion orchestrates a war with Prideri in order to cause Math to leave the castle so that his brother, Gilfathwi, may sleep with Gawain, uh, a virgin footholder to the king. The birth of Say is indirectly caused by this event. However, an even closer parallel is the infiltration of Balor's castle by Cian, father of Lu, which results in the birth of the divinely prophesied son who will liberate the gods. Balor has locked Ethlu in an inaccessible tower just as Arthur's mother, Imgren, is sealed in an inaccessible castle by Gorlos. Magic is used to access the tower and the result is the birth of a divinely ordained and prophesied child. Merlin, representing the Druid, makes the prophecy about who is to be king. Other examples of such divine children are Conhovar, son of the Druid Kavad, who prophesied him, but also served as his father, and Conramor, son of an unknown young man who comes to his mother in the form of a bird, uh, likely the son of Lu. All of these examples seem to go back to a single source of the druid facilitating the birth of a prophesied child, often through rape by a god, or by a druidic figure acting on behalf of a god, or a figure directed by a druid. By wielding the prophetic powers, the druid is able to confer legitimate kingship by interpreting the god's will, perhaps especially through celestial signs as is intimated in relation to Merlin. There is also a potential that the prophecy relates to the rebirth of a king along a certain lineage. It is the death of Ambros which creates a comet in the form of a dragon, the sign of the coming birth of Arthur, who must be born to Uther, brother of Ambros, because the incarnation takes place along family lines generally and is evidenced in Irish myth. And so the prophesied king is perhaps to be seen as the reincarnation of the one true king, an avatar of Lug in mortal form. The true king always seeks to eliminate the false king who came before him, thus Lug's battle against Bress. In fact, Vortigern is very much in the mold of Bress. Similarly, Ambrose's first act as king is not to expel the Saxons, but to take revenge against Vortigern for the murder of his father, another parallel to Irish myth about Lug. The druid or wizard who chooses kings is ingrained in our cultural memory, partially continued in the present by figures like Gandalf, who partake in the same mold. And this is what is ultimately reflected in the story told by Joffrey of Monmouth and added and expanded on by many others. Merthyn was a real man, a bard, a pagan, likely a druid and a seer, but Myrddin is also the archetype of the wizard or druid, a semi-divine figure that is the gateway to the gods and whose narrative mirrors the myths of the gods themselves. He is the druid who is able to bring about the rise of the true king. Lord of Battle, Seu Emris, Chief Sorcerer, Myrddin Emris. Please like, subscribe, share, uh, check out my Patreon page and our website. Dioch yawn amrando ach vel bobamser sevuch andal.